Today I want to share a Christmas message. Uh, obviously everything we do right now is a little bit unusual because of the, the personal season we are in. But uh, we are seeing so many, uh, so many truths and realities even through the uh, Christmas uh, season, the Christmas story and uh, all the scriptures, scriptures that we thought we knew and now we read them again and they mean something different to us now. Uh, and, and so I'm hoping and praying, I've been receiving lots and lots of notes, um, emails and uh, uh, messages coming from uh, people that have been attending on Sundays or watching online about this uh, series and how much it is helping you and our authenticity, uh, walking through the suffering we are, that, uh, that it is uh, being a blessing. In fact, I just uh, this morning read a long letter, it was placed on my desk and and uh, just saying that, that you, your whole family has been uh, changed by these messages and you're able to have conversations that you were never able to have before. And that's our prayer that God will use it. And today I want to take us to uh, the book of James. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up to the book of James. Uh, Jesus came, his advent into the world uh, was that he might show us the Father. And uh, James writes, uh, James is the half-brother of Jesus, and James writes uh, to us uh, these five chapters that are uh, some of the most challenging um, phrases in, in the entire Bible, at least in my mind, uh, to um, our personal behaviors and, and calling us up higher, if you will. And so uh, my prayer is that, uh, you know, we will take these messages rather than principalize them um, is, and really apply them and, and put them into our actions and embody the message of, uh, of not just the book of James here, but embody the message that uh, Christmas offers to us. James chapter 1, verse number 1. It's interesting, just the second little phrase here in chapter 1, verse 1. He says, I am writing to the 12 tribes, Jewish believers scattered abroad, Greetings. It would be easy to run past that phrase, except this time when I read it, uh, my, you know, uh, we called in theological circles the diaspora, as Jews were, were chased all around the world, and the providence of God that took the message of Jesus all over the world through the persecution that uh, was happening to, for these early believers and, 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 and the Jewish people even themselves. So um, I want to give you some things today that will uh, help us uh, on the journey, but number one, the thing that I learned just from that little phrase is that God's people have always had trouble. God's people have always had trouble. It would be easy to think that um, if you're new to faith or you've come to faith over the last few years and you're thinking, man, I thought it would get easier. I think life is life and you're going to go through what it is you're going to go through. Uh, and the message of the gospel is, and certainly the message of Christmas, that he is Emmanuel, God, what, with us. So he is with us in our troubles. He is with us in this. And here it is in the book of James. It just jumps off the pages that he's writing to people. And I want you to, I want you to get this in your, in your mind. It's so easy to, to look past it. He's writing to people who have lost their homes. He's writing to people who have lost their uh, schools. Their, their uh, you know, the kids were educated at home, but they, they had lost their little group that they were, were being educated through. And then uh, people had lost their uh, businesses, uh, uh, were, were gone. They were being scattered abroad, like everything was in upheaval. Uh, and so I would say this Christmas season that you are surrounded by people that are hurting if you can uh, just stop and, and just take a look and notice. And so I'm driving home this idea that God's people have always had trouble. If you have trouble in your life, it doesn't mean you're not God's people. It just means you're, uh, uh, you're a human. Uh, you have trouble. Now, some people bring trouble on themselves. Some people make the trouble that would have happened to them, they make it worse because of, of, of you know, stuff that they do. But God's, God's people have always had trouble. Uh, it, it doesn't make them bad people. It makes them hurting people. There, there could be a person seated right beside you on the pew or in the foyer um, that are, are going through something so deep and so heavy and you're not even, uh, you're not even aware of it. Uh, and, and even in our situation with Whitney for two years, for, for the four years was, was unbelievable, but that last 24 months was so hard because we, we lived with this, 
uh, cloud over us that was just so, so dark uh, and heavy, and we knew what the consequences were in the sense that, and we were just confident that God was going to heal. We had beliefs that God was going to heal. And so we were struggling, uh, and yet many of the people around the city and even some maybe in the church thought, well, she's got cancer, but if you get cancer, things get better. You know, you, you get better. Or if you get cancer, here's somebody told the story, I got cancer, and then they cut it out, and, 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 and they're okay. And so we kind of have a way of just thinking, oh, things are going to work out. Things are going to work out. But there are people around you that things didn't work out. There are people around you that are suffering at work. And so what I, what I think... What I want us to do in the do good piece, and it's exactly what Heather said, it's the theme of the Holy Spirit today. Don't walk around those people that just need somebody to be with them. It's the being with them that is so uh, representative of the Christmas message. So I think we need to do more listening and less lecturing. More listening and less lecturing, right? Uh, and you know, if you hear somebody talk a lot, if somebody really has a lot to say, they probably don't know a whole lot. It's the people that, that are that quiet, you know, E.F. Hutton kind of one-liner person that just like, they, they just kind of a drop the mic moment when they say something, you're like, ooh, now that, that was good. That's because they didn't waste that all day long. <laughs> you know, they hold on to that. So less lecturing and just more. So I think as the body of Christ, as we come to learn this, and I think James, as he just leads off his his initial epistle, he's, he's just saying, look, I'm writing this because all of you have been scattered, uh, scattered abroad. I've got some things I want to say to you. Verse 2 says this, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind or various kinds, depends on what your translation is, come your way, consider it an opportunity for good. It considered an opportunity, and, and the, the good part will be translated in different uh, ways and different um, uh, translations and and uh, but uh, verse three says, "For you know that when your faith is tested." So one connection we need to make is when when God's people have trouble, their faith is going to be tested. When God's people have trouble, their faith is going to be tested. And charismatics, we've developed we've developed you know five steps and and three this and two that's to kind of get around this whole thing where well. No, this is coming. Uh, the, this trouble is here, but I'm going to get around it by what I say, what I declare, or whatever. But uh, what James writes here is that when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for good. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to hear, well, you know what, you're going you're gonna to develop some spiritual muscles out of this. You're going to develop some endurance. Verse 4, James writes, so let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And so what I want to say today is number two that I got out of this is reframe your troubles as an opportunity to do good. Reframe your troubles as an opportunity to do good. It's, it's actually scriptural. So when, you are, when your faith is tested, and, and look to your neighbor and tell them this now. Your faith will be tested. Go ahead. Look to them right now and tell them. Your faith will be tested. Now, we don't like to hear this. I, I'm telling you, I don't like to, you, you don't like to hear it. But your faith, will be, your faith will be tested. And so one of the ways in which you, you get through that test is you reframe those troubles as an opportunity to do good. And so uh, a challenge... A challenge, uh, I looked it up, a challenge is different than an opportunity. A challenge is different than an opportunity. A challenge is defined this way. A challenge is an invitation to compete in a fight or a competition. That, that brings, that, that elicits something, that's a challenge. You're going to fight. That, that brings a different emotion than opportunity. An opportunity is defined, and they use the word chance. It says it's a chance to take the bad and use it for good. It's, it, it is, it's, not, it's not a fight in the classic sense of a, of a competition or a challenge. In other words, doing good comes out of the bad things that you experience, if you'll allow it. That doing good, no matter what it is you're going through, whether, and we have, uh, we have a chaplain that works with abused women, uh, in our church that have experienced uh, sometimes 
uh, uh, terrible things, even in the name of God, or somebody misquoting the Bible, and and uh, and, and and she does ministry to these uh, women that are are walking walking this out. And every situation is different, and it's always complicated, and it's always painful. But she herself has walked that journey uh, uh, of challenge and difficulty, and faced it, and her faith was tested, and. And uh, she endured and found God's help in that. And so now she takes her pain and turns it around and is able to do good to others that are, are suffering. She's on our website in case you're here uh, and need to get a hold of her. Just look for the chaplain's page and, and, and sc- scroll down through there. And so doing good, when it comes out of bad things experience, I'm thinking, well, what, what do I need to, how do I need to think about that? There are four ways to think about that, and that, uh, four different ways to kind of reframe your troubles. So let's say yours isn't as, as uh, heavy as uh, some of, uh, what some of us have gone through recently, but you're still in a bad situation, whether it's at work or, or whatever. It's free, four, four ways to kind of reframe what's going on in your life. Uh, first, notice the trouble going on in others' lives. Hey, wait a minute, somebody else... Somebody else is also struggling. I'm not the only one going through stuff. I'm not the only one uh, uh, going this. Because once, you, once the enemy can really get you isolated, especially related to your suffering and your pain, uh, then, then uh, you know, that really turns up the thoughts. And the thoughts can lead to, to really, really, really bad places. Uh, so notice uh, the trouble going on in other, others' lives. Uh, we have we have seen that and, and been made, made aware of that now from many states and even uh, even uh, received international messages of people that have lost uh, lost young children um, and it is you know uh, they have categories for everything you know if you if you lose a spouse you're a widow or a widower you know they have categories for every. Or, or uh, you know, when uh, you, you lose your parents, you're an orphan. But when you lose your child, there's no category for you. And so we're finding those folks around the world. And we have no answers for them, but we are able to, to sit with them in their pain too. And hold on, hold on to the Lord together in that way. And so you notice the troubles going on in others' lives. And it helps a little bit. It certainly helps to reframe what you're going through. Secondly... Use your trouble as a, a way to enter the real world around you. Uh, you know, uh, Darla and I, all this week, have, she's been uh, studying the, the Word and has an incredible insight on so many different passages. But one of the things that uh, she was sharing with me this uh, week is that, you know, it's so easy when we read some of the textual stories, we just look right past uh, we, we look right past the pain to try to get to the, the, the message or the principle that's going to fit us. I'll just use one, and, uh, and, and, I, and I believe that you know, uh, you, it will bless you. The guy that I'm quoting, this, this book, James, was the stepbrother of Jesus. But it's, it's not easy, it's not too far away to realize, wait a minute, Mary didn't just lose one child, she lost two. See how easy that is? When we think, oh, but I thought Mary, you know, uh, yeah, she, she lost two kids. That's, that's kind of, like, I hadn't thought of that before. Have you thought of that before? Maybe you have. I had missed that. She didn't just lose one son, she lost both sons. It's an incredible pain in, in Mary's heart. Uh, another thing, and when you're reframing your troubles, Use your suffering as a way to connect with someone else. You know, yes, you know, I, I've, I've, been, I've been through that. Or, or yes, I, I, can, I haven't been through exactly what you're going through. Or, or like this week, someone, I uh, was actually uh, during the Thanksgiving break, I, I bumped into someone, and they told me the story. And, and I actually could not relate to what they shared and, and what they were going through. And I said to them, I said, you know, I just don't know what to say because I've never experienced that. And I could tell that brought a level of, of even connection to us, even though I hadn't been through exactly what he was going through at the time. Last, I think you sit down beside others and we learn to be present to them. And for me, this is the incarnation in, in, in itself. This is... This is the incarnation of Jesus for us. 
verse 3, he says that when your faith is tested, and your, your, your faith is tested, so trouble tests your faith, and endurance comes if you hang on. And so the biggest truth that I can share so far is what I've found is there's a huge difference between belief and faith. There's a huge difference between stuff you believe and faith. Those are two different animals. Faith, in fact, in the English language, in the Greek and Hebrew language, faith uh, is, has action to it, has a verb to it. So, uh, um, but faith in, a, in American context, in the English language, kind of can end up being a noun, if you will. It's kind of the subject. Uh, did you have faith? But the word faith actually is really asking the question, so where are your loyalties? So you cannot have faith both in money and in God. Do you see, do you kind of see where I'm going? So do you, where are your loyalties? So when you say to have faith, so to have beliefs is different. So we're raised with beliefs. I've written uh, uh, manuals for uh, churches and as we work through on uh, Wednesday nights and Sunday schools and, and written national uh, uh, curriculums uh, as ghost writers and, and, and made money when we were in our 30s uh, uh, writing material. And those were beliefs. Those are beliefs. So you can get to a belief. But we believed, we believed, and so did Whitney, that she would be healed. But now that she wasn't, how does that hit our faith? So it, it really... That wasn't a faith question, so we had the faith thing going. We did everything right. We did all these things right. Then that doesn't, so those are beliefs. So now our beliefs are all, that, that now that's got to be stirred back around. It's okay, now in light, since, since all of those beliefs were not exactly true, now what do we believe, right? And, and you redo those beliefs and rethink those beliefs. But that's very different than saying that we lost our faith, so faith, our loyalties, what is, what is uh, I think it was Job that says, though he slay me, right? So the faith and belief are different. And the reason this is important for us to get uh, and why I believe it is, is such a big truth is I would not base your life on beliefs. I would base your life on faith in the one who gave himself for you. That your faith is on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You see, faith is looking for something that we love to love us back. Faith is looking for something to value that will give us value back. Faith is looking for someone to honor and respect that will sustain our lives. And so when you literally are on the faith journey, you know, in, in the early days, uh, you, we would have known I could have used Pilgrim's Progress right here. First of all, nobody in this generation knows what a pilgrim is. You know, but a pilgrim was this idea, is not that Thanksgiving pilgrim, okay? Pilgrim was this idea of, of, of someone on a journey that didn't know. They had a little knapsack over their shoulder. They didn't know how long the journey. One pilgrim asked, does the road wind uphill the whole way? And the old veteran pilgrim said, yes, son, it's the whole way. Gee, that's not good, is it? That, and our, our victory beliefs in, in America that have kind of been muddied a little bit with, with culture and stuff are, are kind of being shaken. And whatever can be shaken should be shaken so that we get to what, what, what is uh, truth and foundationally true. And so faith orients itself to the personhood of God. So I don't, know, I don't know as much about God as I thought I did now. I don't know as much about God, but I certainly have a deeper respect for God and a greater humility to say, we don't know everything that we think we know. And that then requires some faith. So I want to give you three giant 
kind of steps what I believe is kind of out of, out of this idea of um, um, belief into something more solid. The first movement is a movement from entertainment to purpose. That self-interest only leads to a decline of, of the true self. That we are not called to save ourselves. God's done that or is in the process of doing that. But the differentiation between us and the secular world is kind of how we spend our time. And so the, the world is kind of entertaining themselves to death. And you can tell what we value in our particular culture by who gets the most money, right? Entertainers and, and sports figures because we, we idolize that. We value that. We, we, we you know, lift, lift that up. But, but I think there needs to be a, a movement or a movement of your heart over into this idea of purpose. Like what, what's the purpose for my life? Secondly, it's a movement from stagnation to motivation. In other words, I'll say it this way, like what is your ultimate concern? Because I can look back and say, over the last four years, my ultimate concern was for my daughter's healing, my daughter's safety to make it out of the, the, the cancer stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, I didn't even think if she could just get relief for the suffering, what I wanted the, the suffering to count and lead to a to uh, her, her healing and, and release here. And so uh, this, this ultimate concern dominated uh, our, our thoughts 24-7. You may have an ultimate concern going on in your mind. Maybe your marriage or, or maybe your job or it, it could be anything that you're attached and it's the ultimate concern. You say, well, pastor, I'm not sure that was accurate. I, I don't care if you think that was accurate. I'm just telling you that's, that was the reality. That when, when we took, when we took uh, family vacation, family vacation for us wasn't the same as family vacation if there's no cloud hanging over you of death sentence. That's a different experience. Or what are you saying? What I'm saying is I think then that the movement from stagnation to motivation is to say we, we hold on to our faith and we tenaciously grab after faith and seek to know God because uh, we... Where else are we going to go? So we, we look to know him and seek to know him in this desire. And so I would say it kind of comes this way in this third movement is the movement from preservation to transformation. That God is always about renewing and restoring. Even if it looks like death on this side of eternity, we still do not have the other side of eternity's perspective. That the wilderness and the dry land, the Bible says, shall be glad, but it's after the fact. God's new creation and new heavens and new earth don't seem to really help me now in my situation. But they, that movement keeps my heart oriented in faith and toward faith. Verse 5 in James, he says, If you need wisdom, then ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. The principle I get out of this is, look, you need God in your pain more than you know. You need to allow God in your pain more than you know. You need to ask for his help, your pain. Even if it feels as if the prayer is futile, I recommend you go ahead and and think it, say it, burp it out. Uh, Whether you even believe it or not, uh, say it. Because I think you need God. You, You need God in your pain more than you then you know. If we get God into the middle of our pain, then we have to ask for wisdom in the middle of our pain. And I love what James says here. He won't rebuke you for asking. Tolstoy, who is one of the most brilliant authors uh, in the history of the world, really, in my opinion, certainly top five probably, he said, people capable of loving deeply can suffer great sorrow. People capable of loving deeply can suffer great sorrow. So let me, let me translate that uh, from, from Russian for you. Love is what has created your current pain and sorrow. If you didn't love deeply, you wouldn't care that much. The reason you're in such pain is because you loved deeply. You're, the, the pain for you may be different than the pain someone else would experience because you uh, assign more value or loved 
uh, more deeply than, than someone else might have loved. And the fifth big thing that I'm suggesting today is that we need to find good and the bad. And I think James is, is writing for us this. We need to find good and the bad. And so how do we do that? Well, we do that by doing good. We, we do good. Whether, whether we feel like it or not, we do good. So here are some truths about then doing good. Number one, God created and planned for you to do good works. God intended that. Uh, regardless, uh, I've already established that in this world you're going to have trouble quoting Jesus there and then James saying the same thing in a different way. But so we do good because God has created and planned for us to do good works. Ephesians 2.1 says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance for us to do. Here's a thought. Um, I think there are two, this is, this is, you, this, uh, you, you will not be charged for this thought. This is free right here. I think there may be two kinds of Christians in the world. I got to think this through now, so I want to declare this, but your first service, I get to practice on y'all. I think there may be two kinds of Christians. There's transactional Christians, make a, make a trade with God, make a, I do this, God does that, I do this, God does that, I give tithes, God gives me money back, this is working. And then I think there are those transformational Christians that say, God has so transformed my heart, I give him this offering, and if he gives me anything back, that's up to him. It's a transformational kind of lifestyle that you've been transformed somehow by this mystical love that you can't explain He's overwhelmed your heart, you know? Uh, I mean, there were so many prayers I prayed when Whitney was one and two and three, thousands of prayers. I prayed every night. God put a song in her heart every night. Uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of prayers. Like, where did those go? Well, the Bible says that the prayers are always before the Lord. Well, then how come, how come it didn't like count? How come that didn't fix that? And I would just say to you, I don't know. But I do know that God is not transactional. It's not, oh, if you get over the 100,000 mark, now you're, in, you, now you're in the platinum edition of Christianity. Right? So I even, I even received uh, a message this week from someone, and I'm only... Just being honest with you, you probably won't be honest with the second service. But someone sent a message that, that suggested that, uh, that, that my behavior as a leader caused God to not heal my daughter. I know. That's what I said. Isn't that amazing? First of all, congratulations to this person who has the whole universe at their disposal and can answer every conundrum there is, right? But it, it's, that's, a, that's a dangerous thing to say something like that, isn't it? Now, that's not the only message we've received like that as a family, but it just kind of, it kind of highlights what I'm kind of poking against, if you will. That's a cultural Christianity that some point, someday, when you're in your little suffering season, is going to cause you to rethink some things you've been saying as truth, right? And so, do I understand everything? Mm -mm. I understand less now than I did, but I know this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And I dare not trust anything else. I dare not trust anything else. So whatever beliefs I have that kind of evaporate under the fire of suffering, I have to let go of those beliefs and hold on to my loyalties are right here. I don't know about all this other thing, but my loyalties are right here. And I believe that's what James is writing to these early Christians and the disciples went through that as well. Doing good also has a purpose behind it. 
Loving God means doing what he tells us to do. And really, that isn't that hard at all, 1 John 5, 3 says in the, in the Living Translation. Loving God means doing what he tells us to do. There's a simple purpose behind the do-good uh, initiative that we are putting forward to you. And, and that is love. We're doing good because we love. Let us love one another, John writes. Third, doing good will require God's power at work inside of us. When you are doing good, I, I, would, I would really argue, and I think you could even prove biblically, when you're doing good, you are doing God's work. Even if you don't know you are, you're still doing God's work because God wants everyone to experience goodness in this world. Ephesians 3.20 says, with God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. So do good. So we do good. Look, maybe you thought your life would go differently than it has. Maybe you thought that it would be more interesting or more exciting or more fulfilling or have less suffering and pain to it. But not doing good isn't an option if you're a follower of Jesus. You still have to do good. And so um, our chaplain, one of the chaplains for us, our chaplain for advocacy uh, on, on Wednesday night, January 8th and January the 15th, you'll come to the main service here and then they'll have a little breakout uh, one hour training to connect you to be an advocate for those in nursing homes that just, uh, and, and other care facilities that just need someone to sit with them for 15 minutes and, and be the love of God to them and do good. And, and you'll, you'll receive some, some instruction on this. To just plan on giving 15 minutes one time a year, one time a quarter, one time a month. Very little commitment, but yet that we can begin to get the do good pieces deep into our heart. So the second and third Wednesday night of January, you could just show up and listen for the announcement and then just go. And there'd just be a one hour training on, on what, what this means to be an advocate for this person and help them in, in some way that, that we can do it. I'm very, very, very aware that in this service today, there would be those whose faith is just being tested beyond what they could imagine. And so I want to pray over you. If you just close your eyes, I'm, I'm not even going to ask for you to respond because uh, there's no need that, that I need to know because I'm going to pray the same prayer and I wouldn't want to uh, those around you to, um, I wouldn't want to cause it for you not to respond or feel like God's not going to help you because he is. So I want to pray over you. If your faith is being tested, dear Lord, dear Lord God, dear Lord God, Father God, I bring your people to you this morning. I lift their names up before you. You know everyone in the sound of my voice today. And I pray over them. And I pray the prayer that Jesus prayed for Peter that his faith would not fail. And I pray for the proper understanding and translation to come to their mind and understanding that Peter did, did uh, deny Jesus three times after this prayer. And what looked like failure turned out to be just a part of his story of knowing you and so, Father, I thank you that the Apostle Peter was who he was, that he preached these great messages, that he helped the early church. And I thank you that he had the courage to endure the crucifixion upside down because he had been transformed by the presence of Jesus sitting by the fire on the side of the lake And may you transform our hearts in here in the same way. And I, so I pray that those in here that have faced and or are facing an unbelievable test to their faith right now, in Jesus' name, I pray over them. 
I pray that not only would their faith not fail, that they would have a proper understanding of what it means to have faith, that our faith, our confidence, our loyalties are to you, Jesus. We assign our loyalties and that they would not abandon that, that they would not give that up, but they would survive the test, pass the test, and that you would help them. I thank you for your graciousness to us this morning. In this service, I pray over those that are just despondent and disheartened that somehow even my presence in the room and my presence behind the pulpit could communicate the incredible strength of the God who is all-powerful to give a broken-hearted father the courage to continue to preach the word. And so, Lord, since that is so, I pray for those in here whose faith is also being tested, that their faith would not fail. I pray for that former professor that's been on my mind and heart who, who resigned and left a post. I pray for that professor, that their faith would not fail. I pray for many, many, many people that I know who have been jaded by the beliefs of Christianity and the beliefs of Christianity on Facebook as it's presented, and I pray that somehow they would um, discover their faith, that their faith in Jesus is still just as real and just as powerful and just as strong. God, I thank you for your mercy over us this morning and for your great strength to us. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Well, I want to uh, conclude with um, something. It's, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a big, I don't read poetry very much. Uh, but when I do uh, find a poem or come across poetry, many great scholars that are friends of mine and scholars I've studied uh, just find so much in poetry and and uh, so I thought I would just mention a poem that uh, has been significant. I'm just going to highlight one thing, and then we're going uh, to shift gears and do a little something else and let you go. Listen to this uh, poem. They don't have, have it upstairs. Let me just read this to you. It's called, um, it's from Thomas Merton, one of my favorite uh, Catholic writers over the last 30 years. He says, uh, when in the soul of the serene disciple... So he's writing, so he's a Catholic, so he would go to Mass every day in this case, uh, and, and, and he would take the Eucharist and, and the, the blood and the body of Jesus' mouth. He lived in a monastery and ultimately ended up in a monastery in Kentucky and then on a missions trip uh, as, a, as a man in midlife, um, stepped into a mud puddle that, that unbeknownst to him had an electrical uh, an open electrical wire laying down in the water and it electrocuted him to death and it just seemed so senseless. But just a few years before that, uh, his passing, he wrote, when in the soul of a serene disciple with no more fathers to imitate, poverty is a success. It is a small thing to say that the roof is gone. He has not even a house. Stars as well as friends are angry with the noble ruin Saints depart in several directions. What he's saying is when your friends see that you're not being blessed the way they think, they actually will leave you alone. And then he says to that serene disciple these words, Be still, there is no longer any need of comment. It was a lucky wind that blew away your halo with its cares, a lucky sea that drowned your reputation. Here you will find neither a proverb nor a memorandum, there are no ways, no methods to admire, where poverty is now no achievement. His God lives in his emptiness like an affliction. What choice remains? Well, to be ordinary is not a choice. It is the usual freedom given to men. It's a deep poem. I knew reading it verbally may not make a lot of sense, but ultimately what he's saying is, count it all joy when trouble breaks out in your life because then you're going to begin to see what really matters. And in the end, what is so amazing is actually 
it's your ordinariness that makes you so amazing because God loves someone ordinary just like you and me. It's the opposite message that you hear in the American culture for sure. Oh, you're special. You can rise to the top, but if we all rise to the top, all we find ourselves just stepping on top of one another. What if we all just join hands in our humanity and our ordinariness and we do good to one another? Amen? Amen. Well, thank you for listening to your pastor this morning, and let's give God thanks for the message. Yes. All right. Now, take your, take your do-good card, the one that, uh, did you get this on the way in? Raise your hand if you did not get this on the way in. All right, we've got, uh, the ushers are looking. Now, we're going to take our do-good card and give these out. So, you've been reporting how many uh, do-good hours and how many do-good movements that you've been, uh, that God, the Spirit has just been compelling you to do. And our goal was uh, to get to 10,000 between now and now. Between uh, just before Thanksgiving and and, uh, the new year. And can we put up the new total? Do you have a a slide for the new total? Can we put that up somewhere? Look at that. We met our goal. 10,101 do good hours so far. Can you say amen? Come on, you can do better than that. That's amazing. So I want you to take this card now. This would be the new hours you've not reported yet. I want you to jot down those hours right there. I want to push on into this. Uh, and I'm not revealing to you why, but near the end of the year, I'm going to share with you something that's going to be amazing that the Holy Spirit uh, uh, led me to uh, some, some years ago, and we've not been able to step into it until now. And it's the right season for us as we begin to transition a little bit. So fill, fill that out. All right, so our offering total is right at $30,000. Can you give God praise for that? $30,000. Now, the ushers, as soon as they help you with the card, they're going to come forward with the baskets, and we're going to receive the second offering. So I need you to do good today in the offering. Now, I've been giving significantly, okay? And I'm going to give another big offering today, and I announce that not just for your benefit, you need to know the leaders participating, but so my wife won't give. <laughs> That's right. It's double our do good. We, double our do good. We'll be in trouble. So uh, I'm going to go to textable giving. On my phone, I have it in as WSF giving. And I'm going to go to the line. I'm going to type in the, the amount. Um, you know, it's a crazy thing because you go to some pastor schools and they tell you, tell the amount, tell the people to give. And, 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 and then in the back of your mind, I'm thinking, yeah, but if I'm sitting out there and I hear the pastor telling the amount, I'm just thinking, he's so full of pride. He's got to tell you, you know what I mean? It's like a conundrum. Like, I don't know. So the angels are watching me punch in the number. Let's just say it that way. And it's a significant amount for our family. It's a, it's a big amount. Now, I will say, over the last four weeks, I've seen a lot of Winston-Salem first people playing the lottery at the 7-Eleven. <laughs> yes, I have been the conviction of the Holy Spirit on more than one occasion. I'm happy to help. But my exact thought was, I hope that you're going to give that exact amount or more in the do good offering. (laughs) Don't you love having a pastor that just kind of tells it like it is? All right, so you have to type in the word good for it to go to that amount. It's not that it won't do good if you give it in the regular tithes and offerings, but I want you to help me get to here, all right? So ushers, go ahead and receive uh, this offering, every penny going into this. Now, I will tell you, I need, okay, and I received a note back, your gift of uh, blank to do good. Um, If this was in error, please punch in the word refund. All right, so no need to do that. So um, in this thing, in this $100,000, I need $10,000 to buy um, comic books that are nothing but God's word and set in a comic book for a Muslim nation. So if God puts that on someone's heart, uh, I need $10,000 that will help me uh, um, 
accomplish, accomplish that total. I, I know this is a real need. I've been watching it for six months, and I haven't told you about it. Uh, uh, but that would help, and that would go toward our do-good total, okay? So I just uh, put that out there. So if, if the Lord speaks to you to do 1,000 or 2,000 or 5 or 10, uh, you can uh, communicate that to us. All right. We have done good. You came to church. You done good. Now be nice to people in the parking lot. Hug some people on the way out. And give a big old bunch of Merry Christmases as you go. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Have a great day. Bye-bye.